Our God is awesome. And that's the reason we're here tonight to study this word from our awesome God. I'm going to desire your prayers tonight as we go into our Bible study. We are excited about what God is doing and what has been happening here. And I'm glad you're tuning in. Please go get somebody. There's an excitement about the lesson that we are getting ready to learn tonight. Now, as you can see, I'm sitting. Ah, uh, I'm trying it just for a little bit. And right now, y'all pray for me because halfway through, I know I may jump up anytime. But right now, I'm going to sit here and go through this word. I need you to grab your Bibles and get into this lesson with us. Uh, we've been looking at one of the deepest teachings, which seems so simplistic, but one of the deepest teachings in the Word of God, and that is we've been looking at the walking or being a part of the kingdom of God. Now let's talk about being in the kingdom of God, especially during this season, that you ought to realize that Jesus has been teaching us how to walk in the kingdom, the privileges, the blessings. We've been set apart for some things that the rest of the world has not been set apart for. And he's also taught us that we can be saved, set apart, and miss walking in the kingdom. You can be out there right now with some privileges and some blessings that belong to you, and you're missing them because you have not followed what Jesus taught about the kingdom. We got into a lot, but right now, we went into the parables last week, showing our character, but now we want to talk about showing our ethical behavior. Write this down. You'll get excited about this study. Watch this. The same Bible that teaches you to believe also teaches you to behave. <laughs> Did you get it? If you don't behave right, no matter how you believe, you can miss some of the promises of God. Let me talk to you about missing the promises of God. When you miss what God has, um, uh, for years I was bivocational, you know that, and I taught school. And I won't forget how, I'm just going to explain to you what it means to miss what belongs to you. I had students who were good students, and some of them were not so good, but I would give them a task to do or tell them be on your best behavior and you will get this. So at the end of the school year, you guys remember this, we all went on school trips and there was the trip to Washington DC. You know, the brown bags and all the stuff we did, Washington Monument. Well this guy for two months proceeding to the end of the school year for his trip, he was great. He was fun. And then about two days before the trip, he went down to the gym class. You know, they, they suspend gym class. He was just walking around, and another guy started with him. He could not control himself. They started an argument. Both of them got in-school suspension. Can you, can you believe this? What was set, about, set aside for him, he missed because he could not control his behavior. That is so significant. If you can't control your behavior, you can read your Bible all day long. If you can't control your behavior, you can claim promises all day long. They will never be yours. So the first thing Jesus did when he taught us about the kingdom was showing us that you also need to learn how to behave. Watch this. And I asked him when he came back to my office, I said, what happened? How are you missing the trip? You know what he said to me? He said, I couldn't help myself. And maybe that student couldn't help himself but that has nothing to do with you and I. You know why? We have the Holy Spirit. We are way better off than Him. If you want to control yourself, Jesus is saying, since the kingdom came inside of you, I'm helping somebody right now. You don't have to have phobias. You don't have to be fearful. You don't have to worry because the Holy Spirit in you will help you control your behavior. You can be in control of everything in your life. You don't have to worry about nightmares. I know somebody out there looking at me, the devil tries to build nightmares on you. All of that stuff, I'm going to teach you tonight how to get ahead of. And so the reason we're looking at ethical behavior is because what's in you will come out of you. So you've got to make sure you know what's in you. What am I talking about? If you hit your hand with a hammer, either you're going to say, ouch, or you're going to say, beep. Whichever, I don't know what those words mean, but maybe whatever came out of you is what was in you. So you can't fool your own fleshly nature, and you sure can't fool God. Go with me to Matthew chapter 5. Now, if you got the, uh, the uh, announcement about this teaching tonight, 
I'm going to be talking about, I'm, I thought I was going to be able to get to divorce and remarriage. I'm going to try. I'm going to tackle these issues. We've already went through the Beatitudes. Then we went through what we call the similitudes. That's the salt and light and making sure that you're the salt of the earth or the light of the world. But now we're getting ready to get into the power that comes through your ethical behavior. Go to Matthew chapter 5 and begin with me in verse 17. The first thing Jesus wants you to know, the reason you can walk in this supernatural ability, the reason you can change your behavior, the reason you can control, get a good night's sleep, have a great day, is because of what Jesus says here. And if you will go with me, uh, we looked at the Sermon on the Mount, and I'm, I'm going to let the screens catch up with where we are right now. We went through all of the Beatitudes, and if you were here with us, you understand that it was some powerful teaching. But today we're going to pick up at Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. I'm going to say it one more time so you can get there with me because I want you to read with me tonight so that you can see what the Bible is saying. I get excited. So I'm sitting down so I don't jump right into, uh, you know, we are... There. Okay. I'm going to read. Read with me. Matthew, beginning at verse 17. Do not think, this is Jesus talking, that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come to abolish them, but not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Verse 18. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away. Watch how powerful God's word is. Not one iota or one dot of my word will fail. Uh, the law until it's all accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of these or does not obey one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever does them and are obedient to them, teaches others to do them, they will be called great in the kingdom of God. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will in no way enter the kingdom of God. First thing we see that Jesus said, he made two statements. He said, first of all, I have, uh, I have come to fulfill the law, not to destroy the law. Now this is very mixed up teaching. People are, are mis, have misinterpreted the scripture. Um, it says, you think, think not that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am come to fulfill the law, not to destroy it. Here is what Jesus is talking about. He did not come to abolish the Old Testament. I just stepped on somebody's feet. We have all of these people walking around with no validity, no validation of Scripture, telling me that the only thing i got to worry about is the New Covenant, but I don't have to worry about the Old Testament. Jesus is getting ready to show us in this text that no, you have to worry about or be concerned about or fulfill the entire law of God. Come on, watch me now. Especially you New Covenant folk, all you think I got to worry about, the Old Testament was fulfilled and the New, the New Test Old Testament was done. New Testament is here. No. Follow me again as Jesus said. Two things he said. One thing he said I did come to do, one thing he said I didn't come to do. He said I came to fulfill the law, but I didn't come to destroy it. Wow, what does that mean? It's right there in our text. Jesus Christ said, I came to fulfill, not to destroy the law and the prophets. The law and the prophets, follow me, is a teaching that encompasses three parts, a tripart part of the Hebrew scripture. I want you to write these down. The order of the books of the Hebrew Scripture, as Christ would have known them, the way Jesus saw the Bible, he could say the law and the prophets because saying the law and the prophets, he was making sure we understood that the law or three parts there, there was three parts to the Hebrew Bible or what we call the Old Testament or the Old Covenant. It was the Torah, first five books of the Bible, what we call the Pentateuch, First five books of Moses, or it was the prophets, the Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar. It is the prophets that uh, consists of the prophets, minor and major. That means all of the major prophets, all of the minor prophets. Jesus knew their prophecies. 
He was talking about, I came to fulfill the law and the prophets. He said, I came to fulfill the law of Moses or the Pentateuch. I came to fulfill the law of the prophets. And I came to fulfill all of the writings. Kethuvim. Kethuvim means that includes the other 24 books in the Old Testament. So all of the books in the Old Testament had now been written, went past the 400 silent years. Look what Jesus said. I came to fulfill all of those books. What did Jesus mean when he said, I came to fulfill those books? He came to fulfill, his fulfillment was that he embodied or he fulfilled every prophecy. Not one prophecy was missing that Jesus did not fulfill. Everything that was written, can you believe this? Every Old Testament prophecy, every situation, that's how we know Jesus is real. He fulfilled it. You know what you're standing on when you stand on the word of God? You're standing on a prophecy that has been said from the foundation of the world or be beginning of the world. And Jesus came and fulfilled every prophecy. But not only did he mean I fulfilled every prophecy in the law or that I am the embodiment of that fulfillment. He said I also fulfilled the prophecy. Watch this. Because the law and the prophets were proclaimed until John, since that time, the good news of the kingdom of God is being preached and everyone is forcing their way into it. One text says and, um, that the kingdom of God come with violence and the violent take it by force. That's the same thing. But this translation is letting us know what the Bible meant. The Bible was telling us that right when John the Baptist came, uh, the law and the prophets were over because John was the first one to say the kingdom of God is coming. Jesus had to go into a big fight with the scribes and the Pharisees because they wanted to continue dominating by the law. Listen to me. That's the problem when you find Christians who think that they are living better than someone else. Quit trying to live by the law because you can't cross enough T's and dot enough I's. Do you hear me? There's no way. I am so glad. I'm not trying to say I'm standing here on my strength and I'm this goody two-shoes Christian. I can't do that. What do I mean? Because the law will always condemn me because I'll find a place where I can't keep it. So right here we find out that Jesus said, you don't have to worry about that. I fulfilled the law. So when John the Baptist came on the scene, the kingdom of God came. So now the scribes and the Pharisees, if you look at the context, uh, you go to Luke chapter 16, you'll find out in the 14th verse, above the 16th verse, the context of this is he was telling the scribes and Pharisees, woe unto you because you go into widows' houses and lead them astray. You do this, you do that. He was telling them, you're condemned because you still want to live with the law, but I came to fulfill the law. And there are people out there who are the sinners and the wine bibbers and the drunks. They're actually leaving your teaching knowing that they can be discommunicated, knowing that they can be, they can be sent out of the temple, no longer being able to be a part of the Jewish community. And yet they found themselves forcing their way into the kingdom. They got baptized. They said, wow, this is something that's better than I ever had. How many out there know you know Jesus is better than anything you ever had? So what I'm telling you is, when Jesus fulfilled the law, there's nothing else we have to fulfill. Every Old Testament scripture was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He clearly indicates that the Mosaic law was about to conclude. And how did Jesus fulfill the law? He fulfilled it by Romans 10.4. Write it down. Romans 10.4, Paul was trying to speak and he said, Christ and the translation that I'm using says he is the culmination of the law. The end. In the King James, it just says Christ was the end of the law. You no longer have to try to live by the law because your righteousness comes from God. I'm telling you how to walk in the kingdom. We have to behave, but he wants you to know, first of all, I didn't come to destroy the law. You still got to behave. Even though I made you righteous, you can't live any kind of way. Maybe your blessings are disappearing because you have not seen some of the strict things I'm going to talk to you about in this kingdom. God said, yeah, don't be so quick to say, yeah, the law is gone. You still have to live by the law, but you have to know that your righteousness comes from Christ. But your behavior taps you into the righteousness. Okay, let me, let me break it down and explain it to you. So, Daniel, I want you to write this scripture down. In Daniel 2, 4, 4, it says, in the time of those kings... 
that God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to other people. It will crush all the kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it itself will endure forever. Uh, Daniel, even in his prophecy, wrote about years down the road, the kingdom coming to pass and Jesus was filling the kingdom. The context of this scripture, you remember that the king had a dream, King Nebuchadnezzar, and nobody could... Uh, Tell him what the dream meant, interpret the dream. And then all of a sudden, Daniel came on the scene. And at the end of his interpretation, he talked about, which was prophetic, the kingdoms being uh, gold, brass, iron, silver. Well, you know that that last kingdom in the second chapter, verse 44, it is Daniel saying that this last kingdom, the time of this last kingdom, will crush all the other kingdoms. And it will crush all the other kingdoms and bring it to an end, but it will itself endure forever. So what he's saying is, the time frame of all those kingdoms, gold, silver, brass, iron. Iron was the time frame of the Roman Empire. It's not a coincidence. God is saying, Daniel prophesied years ago, before it happened, that Jesus would come during the time of the Roman Empire. You have no doubt that the scriptures are fulfilled when they talk about Jesus Christ. So, Jesus fulfilled the law because the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees... Has anyone ever given you a teaching on what the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees were? Write this down, because here's something you need to understand. Because we have some Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes in our churches right now. What were they? Watch this to see if you can recognize any members in your church. The Pharisees are the holier-than-thou people. They are the ones who thought they were spotless in the law. If they grew some spices in their garden, they would tie off the spice in their garden and then let somebody know they did it just so they could say, you know the kind of people that want you to see what they did. Sometimes they shout just so you can see them, let you know they got the Holy Ghost, but they don't live like they got the Holy Ghost. And then we have the Sadducees. The Sadducees are lawyers. They're the ones that tell you stuff like, oh, you shouldn't have said that. You ought to say, I'm blessed, even when you're not blessed. Come on, get off my back. Every now and then, I'm not going to say the right thing. Quit being a, a, a word catcher. Uh, oh, man, I'm not saying that. I said, I can, you can go to one of them and just say something like, uh, well, how you feel today? Well, you know, I'm trying. No, you ought to tell me you're blessed today. Well, today, honey, I'm pushing. Today, I'm praying. Today I'm on my knees. God does not mind any honest praying. And I'll even give you one better. They're the kind that see you running around with a cold and snot running out their nose. And they're sitting around and saying, no, uh, I ain't sick. No, you need four handkerchiefs. You are sick. But that's foolishness. That's not what God means about believing in your confession. Quit trying to catch somebody saying something wrong. That's what the Sadducees were. They were lawyers, legal people, trying to see what you mess up on so they could put it, you know, now we got Facebook, we got social media. They'll put it anywhere. And then you have, well, you, you didn't know about the Essenes. They were off the scene. But it was the scribes and the, and the Sadducees. And there was one more group in there. Uh, it'll come to me. Let's keep moving. So we understand that this is what he did to fulfill the law, right? The first thing he did was, and I gotta go back, first thing he did was he made a way of repentance. That's the second thing he did. First he fulfilled the law by fulfilling the promise. Next he made a way of repentance. If you look at Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, verses 4 and 5. You don't have to go there, just write this down. Here's what the idea is. Matthew says, in those days, John the Baptist came on the scene. He didn't look right. But all the people came and took the kingdom into their life. And they knocked the devil out of their life by taking the kingdom of God by force. Matthew says this. Um, they went to Jerusalem, no matter what the scribes and Pharisees were saying. And they all went about that region. And they believed in John the Baptist. They became followers of John the Baptist who was talking about Christ. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. If you never are thankful for anything, be thankful for the person God used to lead you to Christ. 
I just said something there. You ought to celebrate that God loved you enough to have a believer come around you that led you to Christ. That means that whatever was going on in your life, when the Spirit of God came in, you had enough force to break free of it. You could have been a drug addict. You broke out of it. Oh, you could have been a fornicator. You stopped. You know, maybe you stopped for a year and you had to... You know, work on it after that. But you stopped right away. You stopped doing what you were doing. And you did it because you believed in the power of God. And all that came because Christ made a way by fulfilling the law. And not only that, the third thing, write this down. The power, he gave us power over satanic force. Luke 10, 19. Speaks for itself. Can I tell you something while you're listening to me? Quit being afraid of the devil. i got to stand up here. Quit being afraid of Satan. Satan wants to kill you. If he could have done it, he'd have done it already. While you're running around being fearful, God has already sent protection and protective angels around you. What you ought to be doing is celebrating the fact that, that if the devil could have made me lose my mind, how many of y'all know I would have lost my mind by now? If the devil could have made me broke, I would have been broke by now. How many of you know that God said when I had his, when I had his Holy Spirit come into my life, when I was born again, the Spirit of God is stronger than anything Satan can do in my life. Next time the devil comes, you ought to celebrate God instead of allowing him to make you change the way you feel and the way you think. What am I saying? He said, I've given you authority. Somebody say authority. Now, I want you to get something out of this study. Say these words. I have authority. Man, you just ran three or four devils right out of your house right now. Walk into your bedroom at night, and before you get ready to go to bed, look around your room and just say, I have authority. No darkness, nothing can stop me because of the power of God that's on the inside of me. How do I know that? Jesus said, I gave you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions. All those are symbols of satanic fights. He said, I gave you the power to overcome. But here's what I want you to see. All the power of the enemy. Can somebody say all? There's nothing that should be holding you back. You have all the power of the enemy. Everything. You have enough power to get the devil out of your house. You want to pray over your children? You got all the power. You want to pray over the way you think? You have all the power. You want to pray over your health? God's power is now in your body. So you don't have to worry about satanic forces trying to usurp or counterfeit your walk in God. You have the power. Somebody say, I got the power. I know I'm teaching here, but I need you to understand this because it's good you're listening to me in Bible study, but I know how the devil works. He loves the darkness. He loves when you're weak. He loves when you're not around thinking. He comes with a sneak attack. And you know what he does? He brings back something you already overcame. You don't have to tell me I'm right because he does it to me every day. Next time you bring back something you already overcame, know that he is a whoop somebody. And just like I used to do when I played poker. Pity that. Don't, don't mess with me uh, on playing Opino. I bluff him. Bluff him. He's bluffing. He's bluffing. All I'm telling you is we used to sit down and gamble at cards, and the best thing you can do is learn how to bluff. Can I tell you this right now? Take a deep breath. The devil is only bluffing. Ooh, celebrate right there. He can't stop you. I got to move quickly. Then, not only did he give us all that, the fourth thing Jesus did when he fulfilled the law, when he is now in the fulfillment of the law, he said, I gave you the keys to the kingdom. What are the keys to the kingdom? Matthew 16, 19. Write this down. I'll get used to this chair, y'all. Keep sliding back because I'm jumping up and down. The keys to the kingdom. I will give you. Watch this. The keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Whatever you loose in your life will be loose in heaven. Meaning that your life should be reflective of what the scriptures say your life should be. Come on, watch me. Don't play with this point. You can't walk around halfway there and be satisfied. If God said you have peace, fight till you get all of your peace. Don't wait and say, I spent two weeks, three weeks, just full of anxiousness, full of anxiety. I spent three weeks. No, why? We do it because you won't turn around 
and use your key. What does the key mean? I said it a moment ago. Uh, this was spoken to Peter. You remember that? He said, Peter, I give you the keys of the kingdom. You know, flesh and blood does not reveal this to you. I give you the keys wherever you buy. Here's what he's saying. Peter, Peter used that key in the book of Acts. He used the key. What does the key do? The key gives me the power to bring heaven down on earth for somebody else. Man, that is powerful. The key of heaven is not running around with these magical confessions. The key is, will I be a believer? Will I witness even when my life is not going well? Will I tell somebody Jesus is the way even when I don't feel like he is? Because I know there was a moment in my life when I did have complete control. Oh yeah, hear me. Somebody's getting blessed now. You have to always know I got the key. But the key will no, do you no good if you don't use it. You have to use the key that God has given you. I love this. So what are the keys? Make sure you understand this. Peter used the key when he preached and 5,000 got saved. Peter used the, the, the key when he got let out of jail, when he prayed. All I'm telling you is the keys to heaven is that power that had been funneled down to you. So whatever is up in heaven, you can bring down on earth. And if something is in your life that's not like heaven, you can bind it up down on earth. There's a few things in your life right now you probably need to be binding so you can have a better life. I know, I know, I know. It's like... It's like hollering at your kids. Sometimes I just don't have that energy. Have you ever been there? It's like I'll get them later. I don't have the energy. All I'm telling you is you got to stop that when it comes to what is part of your inheritance. You got to fight for what God has for you. So Jesus gave us, he fulfilled the law. He gave us power over the enemy. He gave us power over satanic forces. And he also gave us the keys to the kingdom. Now let's look at what he also said. Now, that's what he did. He said, I came to fulfill the law. But he also said, I didn't come to abolish the law. Uh, if you look at the bottom of this text, it says, um, not one small mark or part of the word shall pass away. I tell you, as long as heaven and earth last. Understand this. Not one. Okay, so he said, I came to fulfill the law. But then in verse 18, he said, as long as there is a heaven and earth, not one jot. That's just a small mark in the Greek language. It's, it's the iota. It's just one little mark. He said not one, in the King James, it tells you not one jot or tittle. All the jot or tittle is, is a small mark of grammar in the Greek language. He said, it's like dot in the eye, crossing the T. Here's what he said. Not one tittle, not one jot, not one small mark of God's word is going to fail. I got to stop because we don't get excited about that. But here's what Jesus said. Because I fulfilled the law, my word can't fail. So you need to understand, Jesus himself was co-signing the power in his word saying, as long as there is a heaven and earth, my word will not fail. So that means, ladies and gentlemen, that means, brothers and sisters, when there is a failure in my life in the word, it is not me, I mean, it is not God, it is me. Because the word can't fail. Jesus just said not. But look what he said. Now he said, I didn't come. I need you to understand this. Um, I'm messing around with all of these um, people who want to be Old Testament covenant bound folk. You know, all these, all these things. I don't want to mess with anybody's religion because I don't like, you know, signifying on anybody. But if you do not fulfill what Jesus said in the New Testament, when you put yourself back in that old covenant, just say, well, the New Testament is the only one or the Old Testament is the only one. Jesus said, no, let me get this straight for you. Even though you're saved, this next line is important. Anyone who breaks even the least of the law of Moses and teaches people not to do what it says will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Wait a minute, Jesus. Time out. You said you came to fulfill the law that we're in a new covenant. Why are you telling me about the law of Moses? Aha, so I want you to see. Jesus said, I fulfilled the law, but I did not take away your responsibility to have to behave like the law says. Meaning that I fulfilled it by giving you righteousness. I fulfilled it by making a way. But now you have to walk in what I made. You understand? We, we want to act like I can do anything and mess up. No, somebody going to hell. Because Jesus said, once you Teaching you want to fulfill the law, you're the least in the kingdom of God. And all that means, if you were to get 
into a, a commentary and read what the least meant. It meant that you are a person who is not taking advantage of your benefits in the kingdom because you're fearful in keeping the whole law. You're fearful of what people will say. But if you obey and teach others what the law is, you'll be great in the kingdom of God. All he's saying is, if you behave, like I said, okay, so the, the, when we get into the commandment, it says, that's what have no other God before me. Just because you're saved don't mean you can have other items. You got that? So when you follow that and obey that, blessings come in your life because you're not following idols. Listen to me. Your wife, your husband, your children, your job is not your idol. And if you put them ahead of God, you will cut off some of your power. That's what it's talking about. Watch this. He said, and I tell you, unless you are right, your righteousness is more than the teachers of the law. Why is that important? Because the scribes and the Pharisees made the law even more important than people. Follow me. Jesus never broke the law. I'm letting that sink in because somebody's out there thinking, because you think you know the Bible. Uh, how about when Jesus had his disciples, you know, uh, eating corn on the Sabbath? He didn't break the law. How about when he healed on the Sabbath? He didn't break the law. See, what happened is the scribes and the Pharisees had taken the spirit of the law and turned it into a regiment that no one could follow. All Jesus did, and he had the right to do it. He, that's why you heard Jesus say, you heard it said, but I said. You know what he was telling them? I'm bringing down the authority of heaven. I'm giving you God's heart in this text. You now have made it say something that it didn't say. You don't want me to heal somebody on the Sabbath, but you'll get your donkey out of a ditch on the Sabbath. Jesus said, no, that's not what it means. He said, unless you get more righteous, and here is the rub, ladies and gentlemen, you can't get more righteous without the Spirit of God. Righteousness is not in us. So, you still can't break the law. Here are the things I want you to remember from this past. I'm going to put them all up so I can talk about it. If you want to know what the fulfillment of God is, three things you have to know to get ultimate power. You still can't break the law. You'll be the least in the kingdom. That goes back to what I was saying. If you behave any kind of way, you're going to live a wrong... You behave with a raunchy lifestyle, you're going to live a raunchy life. Saved or not saved. Not only that, when you obey the law, you are great in the kingdom. When you obey the law, more of God's power gets thrown, gets poured into your life. Righteousness has come from inside. Righteousness has to come from the inside. You can't be an outward show and an inward empty tomb. You can't want to make people think you're saved and then know when nobody's looking you don't try to walk like you're saved. Alright, so let's go. We're moving on. That was the first thing he said. The Bible also says, I write this statement down. This is very important. The same Bible that says believe also says behave. I thought that was cool. It's not mine. I got it from another preacher but I thought that was so cool. But in this next section where we're about to go is a section on the heart. This next section will expose the condition of our salvation. If you are a person who is constantly angry, there is a good chance you are not saved. I just messed up some of the angry people. Let me say it again. How are you going to tell me I'm not saved? I accept Jesus as my Savior. Yeah, but you don't know how to talk. And you don't know how to act. And you're nasty. And I didn't say this. I would not say what I'm not going to give you Bible for. No, I'm going to tell you right now, Miss Stang and Mr. Thang, when you walk around telling folk off, got your finger, and you work in bitterness, and you walk around all angry all the time, you better believe you just might not be saved. Take that and smoke it. Watch this. I'm going to show you. It's not me. Jesus said it in this text section. Somebody said, put it up there. Here it is. He said, you have heard that it was said, to those of old, you shall not kill. What it says in King James, you shall not murder. Um, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I said, there it is. You heard it said, but I said. Jesus said, you heard it said. So it doesn't mean it was Bible. It means that the scribes and Pharisees had put something out there and you heard about it and you were trying to live with it. But it doesn't mean it came from God. You just heard it said. Jesus said, but I'm telling you what the heart of my father said because I'm the one who came down from heaven showing you how to walk in my kingdom. He said, so thou shalt not kill. He said, and don't be liable for judgment. Okay, help somebody. 
All the mean and nasty people get closer to your computer. Come on, put your phone up to your face. Watch this. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable for judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says you fool will be liable for hellfire. I'll teach it. You heard it, but I'll teach it. Jesus is saying that murder and anger are just as despicable to God. Watch this. Don't be a murderer or don't be constantly angry or easily angered. It's all the same thing. I'm not trying to tell you that Jesus said if you murder somebody, it's like hollering at somebody. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying Jesus is telling you the same heart that can murder is the same heart that can be constantly angry. The same type of person, because you come on, you come on, you've seen people, they were hollering at you, and if they could have killed you, you ever have somebody holler at you and you know that if, if their tongue could kill, you'd be dead right now. Because there's some people who feel they have a right to be angry and doesn't know it exposes your heart. Look what he said. Jesus is saying, uh, shall be in judgment of hellfire, not in, this distinctness shall be in judgment of hellfire is not in the Old Testament. So anger is just as bad as murder. And he's going to tell us why. Somebody said, why, Pastor? Get this. Let me make it plain so you can tell somebody and get this correct. He's saying if you're a person who's constantly angry and can't control your anger, you have more kin with the devil than you do with God. There ought to be some conviction inside of you that makes you repent when you are angry with somebody. Oh, don't you turn this off because you don't like this. Just be angry. Watch me. Here it is. Here's what he said. The Bible teaches that uncontrolled anger is harmful both to the person who harbors it and to those people around him. Let's look at a couple of scriptures so you get it. It's right this down. Proverbs 29, 22. Let's read. Listen to what God says. An angry person stares up conflict, and a hot-tempered person commits many sins. There it is. You can't be hot-tempered. Well, you know me, child. I was about to go off. You know, I was getting ready to tell him something. You'd be proud of it, too. Come on, you know. You know how to do something. What, what would you vote for Jesus? But you see what you're describing is the condition of your heart. That's what's killing you. That same heart is keeping you weak and open to attack from Satan. How do I know that? Look what it says. You spare conflict and a hot-tempered person will commit many sins. Let's get another scripture. Some people say that's Old Testament. Look at the New Testament. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. James just said the same thing Solomon just said. That when you are an angry person, you do not produce righteousness or walk in the righteousness God has provided. Although anger may be justified at times, the Bible says that those who continue to have fits of anger will not gain salvation. So I said, you're saying it again, Pastor. you got to prove that to me. Can I walk on this other side and show you something so you can follow me? Galatians 5, 19, 21. You know the text. It tells you in the text that uh, it's talking about the fruit of the Spirit and the works of the law. Look at one of the works of your flesh. Works of the flesh. Look at one of the works of your flesh that stop you from inheriting the kingdom of God. I didn't say it. Look what it says. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in the past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the earth. God is telling you those who have Wrath, that word translated, is fits of anger. A wrathful person is a person who, quite frankly, you're scared of because you know you can't talk to them. Because they will always jump on you and say the wrong thing. But here's the bad thing. Jesus said, if it's a person who is constantly there, you shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I don't pretend to know 
the depth of that statement, but I will tell you this, I believe that if you believe idolatry will send me to hell because it means I'm not saved, but I have another idol, another God. If you believe that if I practice witchcraft, why don't you believe being wrathful? We'll do the same thing. Because we like being angry if we don't control our flesh. Well, let's move on. Look what Jesus said. The Bibles contain principles that can help a person deal with their anger. Please write this down. If you're an angry person, take a screenshot. Do what you have to do. But I need you to understand this. Look what he said. Ephesians 4.26. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Oops. The fact that Jesus did sometimes, I'll put that back because that went too fast. Ephesians 4.26 tells us that anger is an emotion that has a place but not fits of wrath and anger. Are you with me? Jesus gives us knowledge of what kind of anger is the kind of anger where we are not sinning. He said, do not let the sun go down on your anger. See, what I'm telling you is, you got folk that don't talk to people. Ooh, just messed up. I felt a spirit coming through the phone. Come on. Come through the screen. You got people that get angry and stop talking to you for days. If you're the kind of person that can get so angry that you want to keep being angry forever, then you're the kind of person who may be in danger of going to hell. Because the reality is, if you go to anger so long, it turns into bitterness. And you think you can be saved and name all the people you don't like. You think you can be saved and sit there and name all the people you ain't going to never talk to again. You think you can be saved, love Jesus, go to heaven, and treat people Oh, in a way that takes away from their dignity. Can't do it. Watch the question Jesus said. The fact that Jesus did sometimes become angry indicates that anger itself, as an emotion, is amoral. Anger doesn't have a morality to it. It's how you use it. Right? Anger is bad when the person used it means it for bad. But it can be good if it's working toward the kingdom of God. Uh, Nehemiah got angry that the walls of Jerusalem were torn down. There's righteous anger, but that didn't hurt anybody. The anger God's talking about is the kind in your heart where you can snap, let loose on folk, and not change your walk in, the, in God. That's the kind of anger he's talking about. Watch this. Um, you have to make sure you handle the anger and it does not handle you. I'm going to put these up there. Now, watch what Jesus did. Jesus gave us examples of what kind of anger is an anger that won't kill him. His anger had the proper motivation. In other words, Jesus' anger did not arise from petty arguments or personal slights against himself. It wasn't a selfish anger. You messed with me. No. When Jesus went to the temple and whipped the money changers, it had nothing to do with him. He said, you made my father's house. He was angry. He didn't take it out. He didn't call names to folk. He went out there and cleared the temple and they said that it was what's called righteous indignation. His anger had the proper focus. His anger was not at God or at the weakness of others. His anger targeted sinful behavior and true injustice. So the second thing is when your anger is at a person, Jesus never became angry at a person. His anger always was focused on what is it doing to that person's life in the kingdom of God? His anger had the proper supplement. Mark 3.5 says his anger was attended by grief over the Pharisees' lack of faith. So watch this. Even if he got angry about a situation, he in turn still had grief and felt sorry for the person who was doing the act. Man, that's Jesus. His anger was, yes, I'm mad at you, but I'm still concerned about your soul. And I still love you. I got to tell you, Pastor, I've had some people that I've had to love from the pulpit. And I know, you know, I heard things. I, I heard the stuff. But I, you can't take that stuff in your heart and in your spirit because it will destroy you. And if you really say, it will wash right off the back. You won't even be concerned about it. And you can love, hug, and kiss that person next time you see him. His anger had the proper control. Jesus was never out of control. Luke 19, 47. 
when he went to the temple, he did nothing simple. He controlled his emotions. He just put the money changers out and kept trucking. His anger had the proper duration. This is a very important one. He did not allow his anger to turn to bitterness. Don't hold grudges. Don't hold grudges. Grudges kill you and stop the flow of the Holy Spirit. Somebody say, I don't like this teaching. That's because it's telling you that God's looking at your heart. Here's how we stop murdering with our anger. I'm going to leave these up so you can see them. We ought to carefully preserve Christian love and peace with every brother. So, there's two things up there. First thing is, try to be at peace with everyone. If something happens, you be the peacemaker. Tough. What I'm telling you right now, it takes the Holy Ghost. This is the tough stuff I'm saying right now. But if you do it, God will bless you. We should confess our faults, humble ourselves before our brother, making an offering that satisfies us. How do I know that? Because the word we just read said this. When, 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 it, when Jesus was talking about this, he said, when you go to your, go to your brother, and take an offering to your brother and make sure that you offer. And the offering he was talking about taking to your brother is that you humble yourself and confess your fault to your brother, make up with your brother, and God will bless you. So preserve peace. Be the first one to make up. I've cut this to a Next, we should do this quickly because till this is done, we are unfit. Look at this next one. You can't even commune with God when unrighteous anger is living in your heart. Are you saying God doesn't hear me? I'm saying you're so angry you don't know whether God hears you or not. Because when you start walking this path, and if you get yourself to see thinking God can hear you and you can live any kind of way, you won't be blessed. When we are preparing for any religious exercise, it is not good for us to make that occasion of service. Or oh, we should also at that time examine ourselves. Write that down. If I really want to know how I'm walking in the kingdom of God, take my focus off what the other person is doing. I know some of y'all don't like me. Pray for Pastor Thomas. Examine yourself. Examine you. That's the only way you can get more power in your life. Do it while you can, the text says, because while you can get forgiveness for it, don't wait until death. It'll be too late. Right? Good, good, good. I got time to sneak this last thought in for the night. Because this is a good one. Are you ready? So we just got done talking about fulfillment of the law. We just got done with murder and anger. Let's talk about adultery. Why don't we? Adultery. Talk about it. You ready? Here we go. Matthew 5, 27 through 30. You have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Can all the brothers say, I repent? Can all the brothers say, I have been in adultery? All right, now, I found out. I found out, I found out when I was in college. A, a girl told me one time, and said, y'all ain't the only ones looking. We be looking too. So some of y'all sisters need to repent right now. So here's what Jesus is saying. Watch this. He's talking about the heart. Now, i got to say this because, and, and we'll get to it in a minute. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out. Somebody else should be blind right now. That's what it says. For it is better you lose the eye than lose your whole soul. If your arm, any part of your body, cut your arm off. Here's what Jesus is saying. It is better that you lose some members than not go to heaven. Why is Jesus putting all of this um, predicated upon going to glory because a lot of these actions you would, what, what did you do when you received Christ it says I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth so that means that the word of God went in your heart if the word of God went in your heart your heart should change and so Jesus is using that to let you know that if you continue to let stuff be in your heart it can stop you from going to glory Everybody likes looking at, look, we like looking. We like looking. Close your eyes. We're honest people at. We look, we look, we look, we try. We got to close our eyes if we have to. Do what you got to do to change your heart. Watch it. And here it is. Oh, we got to close. People are here and they're acting up right now. The dictionary defines, I want you to know the real definition of adultery. Adultery is sexual intercourse between a married person 
and a person who is not his or her spouse. So, both of you don't have to be married. If one is married, you're committing adultery. And the Bible would concur with this definition. Look at Leviticus 18.20. God told Moses, do not have sexual relations with your neighbor's wife and defile yourself with her. That means if you got a nice looking neighbor's wife and, and she throwing the business your way all the morning, tell you to come by and fix something in the middle of the night, I'm just messing with you. Don't do it. All I'm telling you is this, is that when you commit adultery, you are committing an act in your heart that is destroying your heart. This is the beginning. Deuteronomy. If a man is found sleeping with another man's wife, you know, I hate the fact that all these texts talk about men. But I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Um, but the man who slept with her and the woman must die. In the Old Testament, some of us would have been dead by now. Uh, it's clear from these definitions that adultery refers to a consensual sexual union. Here's why um, I believe if you go to psychology today, it'll tell you that men's brains, our brains are triggered or wired by visual. Uh, what triggers a woman's sexual desire is her assessment of her emotions and her visual. But a brother, the reason they call us dogs, yippee yay yeah, yippee yay yeah, yippee come on, y'all, bow wow, come on. All I'm telling you is the dog in us is because visually we see somebody we would like to have sex with. I know the brothers don't like me now. I'm giving all the secrets. And I'll give you a great one. Uh, me and the guys were down to the church one day painting. And we were painting the building. This is back in the day we had our other church we were trying to get together. I was a young pastor, new pastor. Me and the deacons out there. And a girl walked by. And uh, I tell my church she had on singing jeans. Y'all know what that means. She was walking by. All of us turned around and looked. Everybody. But I was a pastor. So the brothers was there. You know what the brother said? The brother said to me, I'm painting, right? So I had already got my quick look. And I said, brothers, we ought not be looking like that. And they said, man, how you know, how you know? Because I look. Come on. We got to learn to control ourselves because if we don't control our vision, and watch this, you can get to the point that that sexual drive, that's why men get so hooked on pornography. I know I'm messing tonight. Because what happens visually is stimulates a part in our mind. There's a physiology in our brain that kicks off with pornography. When we look, there is something that gives us satisfaction. It is almost an addiction. Come on, all the brothers will turn our program off next week. Come on, stay with me. We're gonna, I'm going to give you some help right now. Here's what Jesus said. But when you look at a woman to lust after her, you committed adultery in the heart. I told you, women do it also. Jesus explained that it is possible to commit adultery or murder in our heart or mind, and this also is sin and prohibited by the commandment against adultery. The sixth commandment of God. Watch this. So, Pastor, where is the hope in all of this? God said we can change our heart. Adultery in our heart can be controlled. It can be controlled. Since Jesus considers adultery in the heart a sin, we know what we think about and allow in our heart to rest on is based on our choice. Let me help you right there, brothers and sisters. You got a choice at the moment your eyes get rested on something that is taking your heart away from God, you can stare or you can turn. If you allow yourself to stare long enough, you, you will begin to not feel the conscious, your conscious will no longer be bothered. And if your conscious is not bothered, you can actually disrespect a woman the way you look at her. But most of all, you can disrespect God. Let's, let's follow it. What am I saying? Many believe they don't have a choice and therefore no responsibility for what they think about, but this contradicts the clear teaching of Jesus. You can't say, well, if if I committed adultery already in my heart, I might as well do it. <laughs> you can't say that. 
you got to make sure you control yourself that it affects other parts of your life. Here's what you need to understand. The eyes control our heart. Write that down. That's a, that's a powerful statement. Our eyes control our heart. The eye is the lamp, Matthew 6, 22. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. Did you know, Scripture just said, you can have unhealthy eyes. You can have eyes that look to sin. You can have eyes that's looking to be sinful. And then your whole body or your walk with Christ is full of the darkness in your eyes. Watch this. Psalms 103 says, I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. Here's what the text is saying. I will not allow, I will start practicing that I will not allow things that bring, that hurt my heart and make my salvation shallow. I won't allow them in my life. Psalms 119 says, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. Here's what God said is your salvation. You got to remember that if you allow your eyes to get the best of you, please pay attention to this. Watch this. David, he saw a woman bathing. 2 Samuel 11 and 2. Somebody said, well, that wasn't so bad. He got his, he got his look on. He got his groove on. He's walking around the room. Got Problem was, when he did, he actually committed adultery, murder, all from a look. Samson. Right, Samson, y'all. In Judges 14, 1 and 3, he went down to his enemies, the Philistines, saw a woman that looked good to him, told his mom and dad, you got to get her for me. And the dad said, can't you find a woman of your own people? Here's what Samson's reply was. Look at it. His reply was, she looks good to me. He didn't say anything about this is what God's will for my life is. Many a brother, many a sister have messed up your life by falling for something that looked good to you. Amen, Pastor. I'm preaching good right now. 16 and 1. He saw a prostitute. This Samson still. And it says he went to bed with her. Got in trouble again. And finally, he loved the woman in Sorak named Delilah. I don't know if Samson knew what love was because his whole life had been driven by his lust. And even this situation with Delilah turned out bad. Why is adultery forbidden by God? Adultery is, we'll put these up so you can see it. I'm done today, but you need to write this down. Adultery. It's complete corruption of God's good creation of marriage. You're going to, don't tune me off because we're going to talk about marriage, divorce, and remarriage next week. Some people have misinterpreted those scriptures. They will tell you uh, uh, when you get remarried that you are also an adulterer. We don't talk about that next week. Let's stay on this right now. I'm trying to help someone without adultery. You mess up God's creation. Not only that, through the sin of adultery, Satan tempts us to seek sexual fulfillment through other ways. Once we break away from what God said is where we're supposed to have sex, we mess up. Adultery rips the fabric of our society. It tears apart the marriages, our families, which are the building blocks of our society. God's law in general says, don't break the seventh commandment. It is in your heart. Tonight we talked about Jesus fulfilling the law. We talked about murder and anger. And we talked about adultery. And we talked about how God is saying, the same Bible that you believe also tells you how to behave. And we need to learn how to behave. Don't, don't tune me out. This is some good teaching. I want you to know next week, I'm going to give you the real deal on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. I'm going to tell you what the scripture says. We're going to go in depth into the text. Don't let anybody tell you what they heard, what their uncle said, what somebody else said. The Bible is our only authority. Let's follow what the scripture says. Tomorrow morning, please join us. 8.30, Facebook Live. We're going to have a celebration of the National Day of Prayer. Please, you can send your prayer requests in. Uh, call the church. 
uh, there's a, uh, you can call Shadow Baptist Church. Can we put our, our salvation number up here? You can send your prayer request in. You can send in. All you have to do is call down to our church, 856-785-0002, uh, or email our church. But tomorrow morning, we are going to, as a matter of fact, I'll make it easier because that is a short period of time. We'll leave the chat room open while we're having our prayer tomorrow. And you can send your prayer request through. And we'll honor your prayer request while we're going through. So 8.30 tomorrow morning, sick, shut-in, first-liners, our youth, our marriages, our homes, our churches, this plague in our country. It's going to be myself and several pastors will be here at Shiloh. Join us. Instead of our 8 o'clock devotion, 8.30 tomorrow morning, tune in. Get up out of your bed and join us for a celebration of the National Day of Prayer. Amen? And there's a number you can call, but also our chat room will be open. God bless you. Well, for this ministry. I got to do this salvation call. I know I'm running two minutes back, so I got to give it to you real quick. Close your eyes and pray this prayer with me. Please, no matter what you think you're going through, nothing is worth your soul. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul. Pray with me. Father God, I thank you that it's not too late. I may be here in this time of virus lockdown, but it can't keep me away from you. I confess with my mouth that you died on the cross for my sins. You rose again with all power in your hand. Because I confess it and because I believe it, I am saved. Jesus is Lord. This pastor don't be saying, God bless you. Have a great week. Tune in with us tomorrow morning, early 8.30. So we can celebrate with the power of prayer. God bless. Have a great night.